I am really glad to be saved. Now, when I say be saved, is that I have come into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and out of that relationship, I discover who God really is. This is an amazing truth and reality about this great salvation that we have. And the thing that I have learned about God, a lot, there's a lot of things, but one thing about the nature of the Lord is that He changes not. He reveals Himself so much like this through the, the Bible, is that I am the God that changes not. Jesus said, I am the beginning and the end. This speaks of consistency. What I am in the beginning, I will be in the end. Now, man is not that way. Man changes, and he is meant to change. What I was at the beginning of my life is really different at the age that I am now. I hope I'm improving, and I hope I am uh, becoming better a person than I was when I was a teenager. So man changes, but God never does. And the second thing that I've discovered about the Lord, and this is something that I have really tried to understand, is a, His desire to have relationship with me, with you. You see, in the very beginning, God created man after His image and in His likeness. Now, the reason He created man in that way and his likeness in, in his image is so that God could have relationship with him. This relationship that God desires with man is not one to be distant or far away, but it was to be very close and intimate. God actually desires that you know him in a, such a degree of intimacy, to know his thoughts, to know his heart, to know his way, to know what he feels, what he thinks. All, it, it, it's incredible. You see, this is the way he created Adam. And then Adam put, was put in a garden. The most beautiful environment man could ever have at that particular time was a garden. God provided everything for him, the things that he was to eat. He provided uh, the environment, the space of a garden, and God would come in that environment and would walk with Adam and commune with him. The Bible just speaks about this walking. There's something about walking with someone, and when you begin to talk, you begin to get to know them. Now, that was the beginning. That was the very start. But Adam didn't want that. He wanted something more. He wanted something different. And so through his desire, he lost that relationship with God in the walking, and he definitely lost the environment of the garden. Well, Adam changed, man changed, but God never did. He still desires that same kind of intimacy. So throughout the history of man, we begin to see God relate to man in various ways, but the heart of God is always to have a close, intimate relationship. So we begin to pick up this story of salvation or the story of God relating to man, and we begin to see man becoming, multiplying, and then a nation, a tribe, and so on. And there became the Israelites, or the Jewish nation. And this was a nation, a group of people, that God desired to have relationship with him. In the history of Israel, God delivered them out of Egypt and then took them into the wilderness and in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, God met with them on a mountain. God actually came upon this mountain, and this mountain would smoke, quake, shake, lightning, thunder. This mountain was a marvelous mountain, and in that mountain was God. And God was so desiring still to have relationship with man. So in this mountain, he called a man named Moses and began to give Moses a blueprint of a tabernacle or basically just a tent. And God was saying to Moses, I want you to build this tent because I desire to dwell among men. He didn't want to live on a mountain. He wanted to get man back to the garden, really. He, he's, he's wooing man. He's always, God does not change. Man is stubborn. Man thinks he knows best and wants to have relationship with all kinds of things. But to have real life 
it was to have a relationship with God himself. So God got him out of Egypt, of slavery, got him to a mountain. Then from the mountain, God said, build me a tavern, build me a house so I can live amongst the people of Israel. So they did, and this still didn't work. And so even through hundreds of t years going by, then God directed them to build a temple, something that was not a tent, something that was not mobile. He wanted to have something stationary so then God would dwell in that temple and be there in the middle of Israel, in the middle of the Jewish nation. He dwelt then in the temple. Well, this still didn't work, and so Jesus came, and he lived his life and his ministry, and he did the most fantastic work anybody has ever done. He was able to bring man into a relationship with God that God definitely desires. So through the work of the cross and his death, it not only paid the price for our sin, the separation that we had between God and man, Jesus made a way so that you and I could have a personal relationship with God so that I could know God and that God could speak to me. It was through the marvelous work of the cross that this relationship came to man. Now, I must believe and accept and learn how to live in that relationship. See, relationships change. I think about Becky and I. Becky and I have been married 47 years. 47 years of my life have been in relationship with Becky. Now, when I began this relationship, it didn't start the way it is today. It has changed and it has grown. So in this relationship with Becky that I have with her, the first beginning of it was simply an acquaintance. Actually, it wasn't even an acquaintance. I saw her, and then I asked people, well, who is she? Uh, what is her name? And then I then initiated, came up to her, and began to talk, and began to communicate to her. My communication to her was not what it is today. It, it was, it's completely different. And so as time goes on, I had an acquaintance, then we became friends, we enjoyed each other's company, we began to do activities together, and through all of that, the relationship with I had with her began to develop. It was developing over and around activities. The first time, I really uh, had a, a close uh, relationship with Becky that was different than just being at church together or uh, eating a dinner together. I said, would you go to the movies with me because we're in a double date? And she accepted that. Now, I went to a movie. That's the activity. This is all external. So it went from that to a couple more movies and then some dinners and then uh, just her and I walking together, driving together we began to spend time together in certain kind of activities. Then it came to the place of being a friends, to hanging around each other, to dating. Then it became boyfriend and girlfriend. But remember, we're still doing things around activities. Then I asked Becky to marry me. And after a period of time, <laughs> She said, yes, and now my relationship has definitely changed. We're no longer acquaintances. We're getting to know each other. I'm knowing her history. I'm meeting her relatives, her mom and dad, her brothers, her sister. I'm beginning to meet some of her aunts and uncles and so on. I'm beginning to learn about her upbringing. She was raised on a farm and then in a ranch. I, I began to learn. This is all knowledge about her, and I would then speak to her. I would talk to her about my life. She would ask me things. I would share things. But I still remember today when she said to me, uh, Joe, you, you're going to have to talk to me. <laughs> well, I have been talking to you. I, I could not even understand that. I didn't understand what she meant. I didn't know what she was. What do you mean? I, t I talk to you all the time. And she would say, no, I want you to talk to me about what's inside you. 
Now the relationship has grown and developed to a place of where it's not activities anymore. I actually kind of bored it. We didn't, she didn't want to just, well, let's just go to a movie. Let's just go take a drive in the woods. Let's just uh, go bowling. No, no, no. I want to know you. I want you to talk to me about you. Well, folks, this is a foreign language to me at that time. I had no idea what she even meant because my whole life up to that time, 21 years of my life, was a lot of communicating, talking. I, I was I'm just quiet. I had a lot of friends. We, we talked. And, and so I did not know what level of communication that she was after. But you see, this is God. I say all of that because the Lord desires an intimacy, an intimacy and a level that is not just his acts, not just his behavior, not just experiences that you may have with him, those feelings or even some, uh, you know, real experiences with God, uh, eye-opening experiences, feeling his presence. Maybe some of you have been healed by him. I've been touched physically by the Lord has healed me. The Lord has healed my children. I've talked much about how he has met our needs financially um, in, in our soul, how he's healed my heart, uh, my soul. There, there's so much of his activities that I know him at that level, but he wants to know me deeper. And he wants me to know him far greater and far more than just his acts. I can look at the world, I can see his creation. I'm amazed at these new galaxies that are being discovered by man. I'm amazed by going to the beach and watching the waves so consistently coming in and going out, coming in and going out. I learn of God by watching nature but he doesn't want to use a medium. He doesn't want to use even a mediator. He wants you to talk to him one-on-one. -on -one. He wants to speak to you, not just about your future and about destiny, but about you. Now this is what brings me to living in this world the ministry that I have. I'm afraid to say that much of the ministry that I see and that I have participated in has always been to try to get people to a relationship with God that their life would change, that life would be better, that they could be delivered from drugs or fear or torment or uh, sickness. I'm always trying to get people in a relationship with God that will make them better. And so I would present it in a way, well, if you do this, if you'll believe, if you'll confess your sins, it, it's always throwing upon that person something that they need to do, a certain standard that I have raised up next to them, like a yardstick, a measuring stick, and say, well, if you could measure up to here, your life will change and things will be better. And true, that can happen, but that is not my ministry. I want to read a scripture. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. And it's uh, an amazing verse because it says, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. So I and you have received a ministry, and this ministry is able to produce in me a hope, a strength, an encouragement that I don't lose heart, that I don't get discouraged, that I don't give up and quit. Well, then I want to know about that ministry because I think I have been operating in a ministry that can be very discouraging. Um, when it says, therefore, you have to read the chapter before that. And that chapter before that begins to talk about two different kinds of ministries. 
Now, ministry was the way God, say the way God is relating to man and man relating to God. The, the, the one ministry that he's talking about here in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 was the ministry, the way God was going to relate to man and man relate to God was out of the Old Testament. It is out of that mountain that I talked about trying to give a, a very rapid historical journey where God met man, Moses, and Israel at Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is a literal mountain. You can go there today. And on that mountain, God came and met with man. He, before that, was a garden, remember? He met in a garden. Now man left the garden. He's completely separated from God. And so at times, God would speak to man, but he'd, he would only speak to him. There was no meeting place. It was just a word here, a word there, but no place you could go to just meet with them. Well, this mountain now was a physical place that man could meet with God. On that mountain, man uh, was given instruction to the, he could come close to that mountain, but don't touch it or come on it unless I'm inviting you. If you read in Exodus chapter 19, I really... Let me just go on. I want to just, I'd love to read to you about the whole thing, get in more detail, but I just want you to try to grasp this, folks, today, because that mountain and the Ten Commandments were given on that mountain. So here's the rules. If you want a relationship with me, you have these ten rules, and if you'll keep these ten rules, we'll be good. You'll be rewarded. If you break any of them, you will be punished. So it was a law written on stone. Now, uh, I know the church world, so he got all upset when they removed the Ten Commandments uh, out of public places and so on. But in a way, you see, God doesn't want to have relationship with us by commandments. It would be, once again, with Becky and I, if she would have just gave me a, a list of 10 things and say, uh, Joe or honey, if you want relationship with me, these are 10 things that you need to do. If you'll do those 10 things, we're good. I'll reward you. I'll cook for you. I'll, um, you know, I'll do your laundry or what I'll have your children, whatever. And so that would have been, <laughs> in a way, a lot easier, but it wouldn't have been much of a relationship. And I ought to just check things off. Well, today, that's the way people have relationship with God. They, they may have replaced the Ten Commandments and put something else there and their own making and say, look, if you want a relationship with God with me, if you do these ten things, we'll be good. If you don't, then I, it's over. And uh, they could think this and even live this way. So if you live this way, you have really no relationship. You, you just... Or everything is based upon your behavior, what you do or don't do. And in that, certain things begin to develop in a relationship. Number one is fear. First of all, man, if I don't get everything done, man, I'm in trouble. So you got a fear operating there. So relationship based out of fear. Or lying, hypocrisy. Did you do it? Yep, I got it done. And on the inside, we know we didn't. We just, we didn't do it the right way. Or we might have done it in anger and bitterness, but we got it done. Well, it's just hypocrisy. You begin to lie. The other thing is you begin to compare yourself. Well, I'm not as bad as that person. I'm not as bad as this one or that one. And so we begin to be self-righteous. This relationship is all based out of that Old Testament. That's what it produced in man. Self-righteousness, a lot of pride, a lot of blaming, and a lot of fear. Uh, so much afraid that I would kill others that would come along and say, you don't have to relate that way. This is a different way of relating. They, they would fight for the position they had because they worked so hard at it. They gave their lives to it. Well, that was the Old Testament. If you read 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it talked about the ministry of death. Anytime you put the law and rules and moral standard on people, it's death. It's not the relationship or the kind of relationship that God wants with you and I. So Jesus came. He opened up the way 
that I could have relationship. Now, the ministry I have received and the ministry that people that believe in Jesus, follow Jesus, is called the ministry of the Spirit. It is actually the ministry of life. You and I live in a world that is desperately dying because they're trying to have relationship, whether with one another, even their animals, or to an invisible supreme being who they call all kinds of names, and they're trying to do it by following certain standards and rules to such a point that even now this insanity get rid of all the laws, get rid of the policemen, get rid of everybody, and we'll just happily live together. That is insanity. That, that is going to cause chaos because we cannot live with one another if each individual is trying to determine and to say, this is the way you live. You've got to live this way. Then we can relate to, well, well the other person has his own way. So everybody has their own law, everybody is doing their own thing, and we're trying to come together, and now we are seeing the result of that, folks. This is the chaos we're living in. This is the insanity that we're living in. So now you and I are thrown in the world, we're out right in the middle of it, and if I go along trying to say, if you do this or don't do that, then you'll be good, or be I'm just in the same mix, and this is why people's minds are closed, this is why their hearts cannot see, they are blind. So how do I live? What is this ministry of life? What is this ministry of spirit? Well, number one, I have a relationship with Jesus. I, don't, I can learn to walk in the light. It first has to start with me. I cannot convince anybody else what to do if, it, if, if, if I'm not doing it. That, that's the hypocrisy. That's everything on the outside. I must, by myself, begin to discover who he is. I want to read another scripture to you. It's in Hebrews chapter 10, and it talks about the differences here. In Hebrews chapter 10, it says in uh, verse 19, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Now, this terminology is going back to the temple, actually going back all the way to the tabernacle where God said, Moses, build it this way. In that tent, it was divided by a veil. A veil separated the tent. You had one tent, but it was divided in two parts by a veil. And only the presence of God, that intimate presence of God, lived on, on one side of that veil. And only one person could go inside that veil once a year with the blood of bulls, goats, and so on, and actually offer up a sacrifice for the sin that separated man from God's presence. Only one man out of the whole nation, once a year, could go into the presence of God. No common believer, no common Jew ever understood the presence of God. They saw him. They knew him only by his acts, but his presence had no idea what it was like. Had no idea. Didn't know what it was like. Didn't know what it was at all. It would soon be like me and Becky. I'm knowing her by her letter only, just writing to me, but never being in her presence. And so now through Jesus Christ, that veil was torn down. And now there is an access to the presence of God, not his behavior, not his acts, but his presence. Every believer can have that. So I can experience the presence of God. I must experience his presence. When I experience his presence, it changes me. It transforms me. It brings the good Joe out. It, it brings something out of me that I was created for. This is fantastic. Now, I'm thrown in the world. I don't have to tell people what to do or not to do. I I know I can be disgusted. I can, and, and maybe you feel that at times in videos I make, and even today, you know, and I 
talk about how insane people are trying to get along with everybody just doing what everybody else is doing. Uh, it, it's insanity. So I don't live in the world trying to convince the world of uh, you need to come to church, you need to follow the rules. No, 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 folks, because the moment I do that, I close, I, the, I pr actually put a veil back up. It even the Bible even says, if I read the law, a veil comes back up. I'm, I'm blinding people. So number one, I enter in boldly to the presence of the Lord. How do I? By faith. I, pr I enter in to the presence of the Lord. Do you think it, it's hard on God? God, it's not on God's side. He's been wanting people to get in his presence since Adam left. <laughs> It's always on my side. I make it hard. I, I, I think I'm no good because of the rules. Here's a standard. Well, you know, you didn't pray four hours today, so you couldn't be in his presence. I can instantly be in his presence by faith. I, I, I allow him to, to tell me what, what's, what's stopping my coming into your presence. Becky said, you don't talk to me. <laughs> I talk all the time, but no, no, no. I want to know about you so I can come into his presence. That's the ministry of life. That's the ministry of the Spirit. That's why it says you'll not lose heart. I, I won't get discouraged because I come into his presence, and then when I'm in there, he'll tell me about his heart. He'll actually begin to tell me about what he thinks. And, and folks, he's told me things that I... I say I can't even believe because it's so foreign to me. It's so, it's so far above me. I, I have a hard time believing, really, Lord, really? That's really who you are, what you have? And it is. And so then, and then I'm this man that lives in this world, and it's not so much what I say, it's who I am. I'm the message. I, 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 my life begins to be a message to those around me. And in my conversation with others, I'm not trying to get them to join anything. I attempt to introduce to them Jesus. I simply want them to meet him. It has nothing to do with me or my church or my um Oh, I, I don't, I lose words. It's, it's my life. My life becomes the message. And God meets with me face to face. Everything in the Old Testament, everything in the old way of relating, God could not do that because it, man needed to be changed. Man was so dis, so far from God that he, if, if God attempted to meet face to face, they would die. He, he, he was saying, that's why if you read that in Exodus 19, read it, really. Because he uses terms. He says, if, if, if men come to this mountain that I'm at and they touch it when, I'm not, when they're not invited, I'll break out. In, in other words, his breakout is not a breakout of death. It's a breakout of life to such degree it would overwhelm them and slay them. It's a breakout of his love. It's, he's, so, he's so excited to have a relationship with you. When Becky, you know, I told Becky I love her first. And I was waiting for her to respond, well, I love you too, Joe. <laughs> she didn't say that. She was honest. She was true. And she... I, I really can't believe it. Maybe she said, well, that's, that's good. I'm glad. I'm nice. Thank you. But she did say that I, I can't honestly tell you the same thing. Well, uh, it was a bummer. But I remember when she did. It was several days later, a week later, maybe a couple weeks later, when she did tell me, she said, I do love you. Oh, I... I jumped out of the car and ran down the street, folks, yelling, Becky loves me, Becky loves me. It did something to me. When God breaks out, <laughs> it's with his love. He, he has no hate. He has no vengeance. 
He can deal with it. That's why he says, leave it alone. I'll deal with it. You leave it alone. He has no uh, vindictiveness. Read 1 Corinthians 13. You begin to catch someone of the heart of God. So I have this ministry. What is the ministry? I have the ability to be on the inside. I have the ability not to see God in shadows and through his works or through his acts of creation or through nature. I can go directly into his presence and there be in his presence and allow that presence to change me and whatever happens within that presence will happen. There's no rules about this now, folks. See, all of that, that's, that's why it's difficult for us because we're not used to this. We want the rules. We want the 10 steps that I can check off. And you come into his presence and you are transformed in that presence of God. And the world doesn't define you. And then now you're in the world and the world looks at you, meaning people will look at you and say, you're a little bit different. And I, I can't quite put my finger on it. And what is different about you? And you're able to say, I have a relationship, I'm in love. And then they'll be go, oh, <laughs> who'd you meet? Well, his name's Jesus. And I know the world has been told so much about Jesus that's not reality and true that they first reject him. But if you're that type of person that really knows him and tell them about him, their eyes will open and their heart will open a little bit and maybe they'll believe in this one that you have met face to face. Well, folks, I know I've gone quite a while with this, but I, it's so real and so true. I pray for you that you may know him more and more and that you walk in that light and get in his presence. Just get in. It's wonderful.